Okay, good morning everyone. Barker Tov, good to see you all here. Nice to have you all back. We are going to uh, continue our discussion of Bishal Akum. Uh, and if you remember, we learned through this very long Gemara in Maseches of Eldazara, where we uh, saw the different opinions. You know, the Jew put the the Jew put the steak on the barbecue grill and then the non-Jew came along and turned the steak over or the non-Jew put the, put the steak on the barbecue grill and the Jew came along and, and, turned the, and turned the steak over. And basically what we said is that as long as the Jew has a hand in the cooking process, it, as long as the Jew has a hand in the cooking process, that obviates the question, sorry Fred, that obviates the question of Bishal Akum. Right? As long as the Jew has a hand in the cooking process. Okay, so we have only certain foods that are subject to the prohibition of Bishalakum. And if a Jew has a hand in the process of cooking, in some element of the process of cooking, so then that would be sufficient. And then the Gemara told us something. The Gemara said, even if the Jew, when it came to baking bread, you remember the language of the Gemara. The Gemara said in baking bread, if the Jew put a wood chip, in the fire, that would be sufficient. If the Jews simply put the wood chip in the fire, that would be sufficient. That was written in the Gemara. Okay, what would that seem to indicate? What would that mean to you? If you read something like that in the Gemara, what would you say? Big leniency. I don't have to do actually any of the cooking. All I have to do is simply add a wood chip to the fire, stoke the fire, turn the fire on plug in the light bulb. That should, be, that should be sufficient. That's what that Gemara would seem to say. And guess what? That is indeed the way that the Ashkenazim paskin. The Ramah, remember, in the Shulchan Aruch, which is our book of, of Halacha, in the Shulchan Aruch, you have the opinion of Rav Yosef Karo, who was the Mechaber, known as the Mechaber. The Mechaber, what does the word Mechaber mean? Author. He was simply known as the author, the Mechaber, who, who wrote the uh, Shulchan Aruch. Uh, that's Rav Yosef Karo. And he generally writes the halacha as the Sfardim follow that halacha. Okay? The Ramah, Rav Moshe Iserlis, who is the Ashkenazi commentary, if you will, on, the shul, on, the, on Rav Yosef Karo, on Rav Yosef Karo's position, writes the positions of the Ashkenazi Jewry. If there's no Ramah, everybody follows the, the Shulchan Aruch, the Mechaber, Rav Yosef Karo. If there is a Ramah, then there's a division, a different practices between Sfardim and Ashkenazim. Here, when it comes to Bisholakum, there is such that thing. There is a division. The there's a division between Rabbi Yosef Karo and the Ramah. What does the Ramah say? We'll start with Rabbi Yosef Karo. What does the Ramah say? Um, we'll start with the Ramah, Rav Moshe Islus, the Ashkenazi poskim, since the majority, since Iraj is in here. Oh, there Iraj is here. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start, we'll start with, the, uh, with the Ashkenazi poskim, with the Ramah. What does the Ramah say? The Ramah says, hey, look in the Gemara. The Gemara Masechas of Old Zara that we learned here together says... When it comes to baking bread, if you throw a chip, in, wood chip, into the flame, that is sufficient. You don't have to put the bread in the oven. You don't have to take the bread out of the oven. You don't have to turn the bread over in the oven. You just have to throw a wood chip into the fire. That's sufficient. Right from the Gemara. Straight out of the Gemara. Of the part of the That's a, taking a part of the challah. Hafrasha's challah is a whole different halacha. No, it doesn't make it this. It doesn't relate. It doesn't do it? No, it doesn't relate to this. You take because you take hafrasha schala. You take chala from the dough before the dough is even cooked. You could take it if if if, if it was afterwards. No, but I'm saying does a, if a goy takes. It's not no, that has to be done by a jew. Right. right, that has to be done. But that doesn't so that doesn't have anything to do with bishalakum. Putting the chip in does that show ownership or it shows participation in the cooking? So according to the Gemara Maseches of Odazar, putting the chip in shows participation in the cooking. The Jew has participated in the cooking process. I, you would say, wait a second, 
That's a lot different than putting the steak on the grill or turning the steak over. Has nothing to do with the food, has to do with just the fire. But that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara Masechah Zavoda said that, we read it. When it comes to, when it comes, what? They gave a basis for coming to that conclusion. The Gemara, Gemara just recorded it in, in its discussion of, in, of a Jew's involvement in the cooking process. According to the Gemara, cooking process, where does, where does the cooking process start? The cooking process starts with turning on the fire. If you don't turn on the fire, you can put the pot on the stove as much as you want. But if you don't turn on the fire, it doesn't help. Right? The process begins with the turning on the fire. Says the Gemara, baking bread... Right, you have to have a fire. You have to fire up the oven first. Baking bread—that's the fire up the oven. You have to start the fire to get the oven hot. So you throw a Jew throws a wood chip in. Says the Gemara Masechah Zavoda, that's good enough. Writes the Rama, that's the halacha. How much involvement does a Jew need to have in the cooking process? According to the Rama, very little. As long as the Jew has a little involvement in the cooking process, even to the point of turning on the fire, lighting the pilot light, right? Uh, lighting the uh, light bulb, Steve, right? Even if a Jew has that, the mashkiach, that's the level of his involvement, says the, shuch, says the Ramah, good. Is there a difference between bread and general cooking? Oh. Leslie is a wannabe Sephardi, right? Why? Because Leslie gave us the perfect introduction to why the Mechaber disagrees. The Ramah, I mean, the Ramah makes sense, right? The Ramah simply lifted the line out of the Gemara. What did the Gemara say? Gemara said, when it comes to baking bread, <laughs> throw the wood chip in, that's sufficient. Says Rabbi Leslie, you could say Rabbi Leslie, I'm not sure. Right? Says Rabbi Leslie, wait a second. Is cooking, is baking bread the same as cooking food? Says Rav Yosef Karo, it's not. And therefore, says Rav Yosef Karo, when it comes to the Gemara told us throwing a wood chip in is sufficient. But that all, the Gemara only told us that when it comes to cooking bread. When it, com when it comes to baking bread. The Gemara didn't tell us that when it comes to cooking food. When it comes to cooking food, what did the Gemara say? Put the steak on the grill. Turn the steak over. Didn't say anything about lighting the fire. In fact, it implied that the fire was lit already, right? That the Jew had already lit the fire. Put the, put the steak on the grill. Says Rav Yosef Karo, the Shulchan Arach, the Mechaber, that this leniency of the Ramah doesn't apply to Svardim. It's not sufficient. If you're a Sephardi, says, right, if you're a Sephardi, it's not sufficient. Writes the Mechaber, you have to participate materially in the cooking process. Meaning, what does that mean? Means you have to stir the pot. I know that. <laughs> you have to stir the pot. You have to put, you have to put the, you have to put the pot on the flame. You have to participate materially in the cooking process. It's not enough to simply throw a wood chip into the flame. So we have this division, a very significant difference of opinion between the Shulchan Aruch, representing the Halacha as the Svardim understand it, and the Ramah, representing the Halacha as the Ashkenazim understand it. The two things, number one, they, they weren't living at the same time, were they? I thought the Ramah made comment on... on the, the, the Ramah lived... Uh, I, I don't... There, there was an overlap between yeah, them, yeah. but, but the was, Shulchan was Aruch came first. Forth. No, it was not back and forth. It's not, it was not back and forth. The, the Shul, Rav Yosef Karo had his Shulchan... Remember, where did Rav Yosef Karo's Shulchan Aruch come from? Anybody know? Spot. <laughs> Good. Right. Yes, correct. Rav Yosef Karo lived in Svat, came from Svat, right? But did Rav Yosef Karo just simply decide one day, hey, I'm going to write the Shulchan Aruch? No. What happened? There was a code of Jewish law that preceded the Shulchan Aruch. What was it called? The Gemara. Not yet, Jerry. You told us all for God. Right? No. The Tor Shulchan Aruch. The Tor Shulchan Aruch. 
right? And if you go into our library, you'll see there's a set, a big set of Sfarim called the Shulchan Aruch. There is an equally big set of Sfarim called the Tor Shulchan Aruch, right? The Tor Shulchan Aruch, right? What is the, what is the, so you know what the word Shulchan Aruch means, right? Set table, okay? What is the Tor Shulchan Aruch? What's a Tor? Comes actually from this past week's Parsha. What's a Tor? Right? It's a column. There were four columns on the, on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. Okay? Four columns or three columns? Three columns and four rows, right? Three columns and four rows, right? So a tour, right? A tour is a column. It's mentioned in this in, in last week's Parsha, Parsha Stitzava. So uh, it's the tour Shochan Aruch, right? It, now, who wrote the tour Shochan Aruch? Anybody know? The Not the tour. <laughs> right? Who wrote the tour Shochan Aruch? It was written by the Rush, Rabbeinu Asher. Rabbeinu Asher wrote the tour Shochan Aruch. One of the commentaries on the Tur Shulchan Aruch, right? You know, so you're familiar with the Gemara, right? The Gemara is in the center. And then on the sides of the Gemara, what do you have? You have Rashi and Tosfos. Okay, Rashi and Tosfos are the commentaries. You know, by the way, that that's not how the Gemara was written. That's, right? Right? The Gemara was one long page of Gemara. It wasn't until when the Gemara started being printed that Rashi and Tosvos made their way onto the page. Rashi and Tosvos were never on the page before that. You had the Gemara. You had a separate book of Rashi. Not a book. You had a separate manuscript of Rashi. You had a separate manuscript of, of Tosvos. Don't you have some without Rashi? Yeah, correct. Yeah, you do. You have some Masechtas where it's Rashbam instead of Rashi. Right? Rashi didn't write on everything. Rashi only commented on Gemaras that he had. But it wasn't, he didn't, there were no art scroll sales back in those days. Right? He didn't have every Gemara. There were Gemaras that Rashi didn't have. And Gemaras that Rashi didn't have, he didn't comment on. Right? It's, just, it's just such a different perspective than, you, know, you want a Gemara, what do you do? You go into the library, and you know, if nobody has stolen it, you can find it up on the bookshelf. Right? What are all the, I mean, uh, all, right, hold, I mean so, all of a sudden, I'm okay. all these shulchan aruchs. <laughs> okay, I don't know what, all right. Is okay. there one, the shulchan aruch that you're referring to is the one from Spot that was written by... Uh, by Rav Yosef Karo, right? And that's and, and that's, and that's the that? shulchan aruch, and that, it, that <laughs> is what we use as our book of halacha. And what about all these other shulchan aruch? Okay, so preceding the shulchan aruch, I was trying to give a little bit of the backstory, right? Everything in life has a backstory. A little bit of the backstory as to where the Shochan Aruch came from. Preceding the Shochan Aruch, there was a book of halacha that was known as the Tor Shochan Aruch. That was, that preceded Rav Yosef, right? He that, didn't copyright Shochan Aruch. No, no, no. He didn't he copyright, did, did not copyright copy. Shochan Aruch. It was called the Tor Shochan Aruch. That's the first. Right? And it was, that was, that was, well... Is it the first one? It's the first one in the Shulchan Aruch genre. Okay. Okay, it's the first one in the Shulchan Aruch genre. You it's the... the no, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about in the, uh, when did, when did Rabbeinu Asher live? I don't know. In the, in the, uh, right, we need to Google it, right? Probably in the, uh, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about, I mean, Rashi lived, Rashi lived in, right, Rashi and Tosfos lived in uh, 1100, 1200, right, Rabbi Yosef Karo lived in 1500, so we're, we're talking between, in that period of time, okay, you know, way, way after the destruction of the Beis Amin Where, Where's the Mishnah All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> All right, Baruch Hashem, another rabbit hole. Okay, so, right, so what do we say, right, so we have this, so we have, so we have the Shulchan Aruch, now, in the genre of the Shulchan Aruch, we're going back to something that was called the Tor Shulchan Aruch. That's really where the name originated. It originated... It, it, 1250. It originated with Rabbeinu Asher in 1250, right? Who wrote this Tor Shulchan Aruch. Why did he call it Tor Shulchan Aruch? He called, he called it Shulchan Aruch because the intention 
was to lay out the laws before us like a set table. Because if you've learned Gemara, you know how hard it is to find the law in the Gemara. Because the Gemara sometimes has 12 pages of discussion before you even get to the law. So it's hard to learn. To learn law from Gemara is very hard. Right? To learn law from Gemara is very hard. So along comes Rabbeinu Asher. And Rabbeinu Asher says, I'm going to put everything down at like a set table. And the sh- he called it the Shulchan, the Shulchan Aruch, and he called it the Tor Shulchan Aruch because he divided it up into four columns. Those four columns or four divisions are other names that you might have heard of. So, for instance, one of those divisions is called, anybody? Choshen Mishpat. Mishpat. What does Choshen Mishpat deal with? All of the laws of civil damages, torts. My ox gored your ox, right? You know, my, my cow trampled on your flowers, whatever it is. I parked my car, my car hit your car. I mean, all of these principles, they don't just apply to oxen, right? They apply to any damages. That's, that's Choshen Mishpat, right? That's what keeps the lawyers busy. Right, Choshen Mishpat. That's only one. There's three others. What are the other ones? What is Ankulus? Oh, hold, hold, Rita, hold off, hold off on that. All right, right, right. Uh, that's that's number one. Give me three others. Orachayim. Orachayim is another one. That's actually the first one. Orachayim. That's the one we're most familiar with because. Orachayim literally means orach is way, chayim of life, the way of life. And it has in, this, in the division of Shulchan Aruch called orachayim, it has all of the laws of daily living, all the laws of davening and all of the laws of benching and all of the laws of Shabbos and all of those uh, holidays, all of those laws, what you do when the first thing you get up in the morning, the last thing you do before you go to bed at night, how you wash, what you wash on, how you eat, what bracha do you say, all, how you observe Shabbos, all the 39 malachos of Shabbos, how do you observe Yantav, how do you, how do you, how do you observe Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach, all, Sukkot, all of those things are in Arachayim. The Mishnah Brura is a commentary on the Arachayim section of the Shulchan Aruch, okay? The Mishnah Brura is a commentary on the Orachayim section of the Shulchan Aruch. You won't find the Mishnah Brura on other sections. In Choshen Mishpat, there's no Mishnah Brura, right? The Mishnah Brura is the commentary only on Orachayim. Who wrote the commentary of the Mishnah Brura? Sachs. <laughs> That's the law. Jonathan Sachs? No. <laughs> No, 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 no. Zach's. You're talking about Zach's. No. Who wrote the commentary of the Mishnah Brura? The Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim was the one who wrote the commentary of the Mishnah Brura. Chafetz Chaim lived uh, yesterday. Right? The Chafetz Chaim lived in our time. Right? So, so you have, you have, if you want to know what's the most up-to-date Within the book of the Shulchan Aruch, it's the Mishnah Berurah, right? When did the Chavetz Chaim die, Jerry? When did the Chavetz Chaim die in the 1900s, right? Sometime. 19... Late 30s, 40s. In the in late 30s, 40s. Late 30s, 40s. Late 30s, 40s. In the, in late 30s or early 40s. I'm not sure. Whatever it is, but Jerry, you're making a convincing face, so I'm I'm going to go with you. All right. So whenever you look up Rabbi Google, you look him up on Rabbi Google, right? So whenever the Chavetz, so the Chavetz, Chavetz Chaim was relatively recent. Right? So, so that's the commentary of the Mishnah Brura. Right? It's the commentary of the Mishnah Brura. But that's a commentary within the Shulchan Aruch. Okay? So, so let's just go back. So, so we have Choshen Mishpat, Arachayim. Two more. September 15, September 15, 1933. Good. Shkayach. Okay. Jerry, I'm impressed. Right? Yeridea. I'm always impressed, Jerry. Two more. Yeridea. What's in the section of Yeridea? What's in the section of Yeridea? Anybody? Marriage. Nope. The section of Yeridea is the rabbi section of the 
right? When you get smicha, you have to learn your idea. What's in your idea? Oh, no, no, no. What's in your idea? In your idea are all the laws of kashras, milk and meat, <clears throat> shechting, uh, all, all of the laws of kashras, the laws of avelus are also in your idea. Right? Not marriage. The laws of Avelis are also in Eurydea, and the laws of Nida are also in Eurydea. Right? Of family purity. So what do I have? So I have Choshen Mishpat. This is not the correct order, but it's the order Steve started us with. Choshen Mishpat. Arachayim. Eurydea. One more. One more. Evan Ha'ezer. Evan Ha'ezer. Not to be confused with the Ibn Ezra, right? Evan HaEzer, right? What is in the section of the Shulchan Aruch known as the Evan HaEzer? That are all the laws of marriage, right? The laws of marriage and the laws of Yibum and all of those of Gittin and Kedushin and how you get married and what a Ksuba is and, right? Those are all there, okay? What do those two words mean, Evan HaEzer? Evan is, a, is, a, is a, what, how do we refer to a woman? What is a woman? She is our Azer Kinegdo. Right? She's our help meet. And the Evan is a stone? <laughs> Jerry. So where does Kitsa Shachnar come into the same place? Okay, so hold, stop, stop for just a second. Let's, let me, let's not lose track. <laughs> let's not lose track. It's what we always do. All right, so, so the Tor Shulchan Aruch, wrote, right, Rabbeinu Asher in the 1300s, wrote this down like a set table, and he divided it up into four different, four different uh, divisions, right? Divided up into four different divisions. On his, so this, he wrote this, this uh, Tor Shulchan Aruch. Subsequent to his writing the Tor Shulchan Aruch, there were commentaries on the Torah Shulchan Aruch. Just like subsequent to the Gemara, there was Rashi and Tosfos. Subsequent to the Torah Shulchan Aruch, there were commentaries. One of those commentaries was a fellow by the name of Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo wrote a commentary on the Torah Shulchan Aruch where he listed all the places that he disagreed with the Torah Shulchan Aruch. And ultimately decided that what would, ha what would he do? He'd write his own Shulchan Aruch. So he went from his commentary, so, so all of his commentaries on the Tor Shulchan Aruch, he went from there to write his own Shulchan Aruch, which we call the Shulchan Aruch, the Mechaber, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the Shulchan Aruch. And one of the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch is the Ramah, who made it from the sides of the page into the actual center, and there are other commentaries on the sides of the page of the Shulchan Aruch. Okay, well, now, so, so now you have, we're going backwards, all right? You have, your tour, you have your Shulchan Aruch going back. You have your Tur Shulchan Aruch. What preceded the Tur Shulchan Aruch when we talk about codes of law? Rambam. The Rambam. Right, the Rambam. Maimonides. When did the Rambam live? 1100. Well, that's where he lived, right? Well, he lived in a couple of places, right? Spain, Egypt, all right? When did the Rambam live? 1100. 1100. 1215. Dr. Brody, nice to see you. Okay. 1215. 1215, all right? I, I don't know. Bob is going to check for us the dates of the Rambam's life. He's going to let us know. Dr. Brody, how are you feeling? Yeah. Baruch Hashem. Good to have you. Okay. All right. 1215. Okay, we heard you. 11, are you, do you know that for sure? Okay, we're, we're, we're getting, we're getting, uh, okay, we're, Howie, what's that code? Uh, 474676. Okay, nice, okay. It works. It works. Okay, good. Okay, so, Right, so the Rambam. Let's get the official dates. Eleven thirty-eight to twelve o four. But Joseph just said, okay, good. All right, so Ashkenazim and Sephardim agree. Okay, right. So what do you have? So the Rambam, the Rambam was the one. The Rambam said, 
you know what? It's very hard to find all of these halachos in the Gemara. Right? Remember, the Gemara, the Rambam lived 500 years after the Gemara. The Gemara was written in the year 500. Right? It was redact, right? The Gemara was written over a period of hundreds of years, but it was finally written down in the year, approximately the year 500. The Rambam lived 500 years later. Right, 500 years later, and the Rambam said, you know what, it's hard to, to find the halachos in all of these Gemaras. So what am I going to do? I am going to write a code of halacha. Right? I'm going to write a code of halacha. And what's my code of halacha? Yad HaChazaka. It's called Yad HaChazaka. It's divided up into 14 volumes which is why it's called Yad, Yud, Dalid, which is 14. Yad HaChazaka, the Rambam, divide, the Rambam divided up all of the halachos into 14 different categories, and he, wrote, and he wrote the halachos, took the halachos out of the Gemara. The problem with the Rambam is he doesn't tell you where he took the halachos from. He doesn't tell you, what, you know, what, where does it come from, what source, what, what Gemara are you referring to, where did that come from. doesn't tell you, just writes down, these are the halachos, like that. That's the Rambam, okay? That was the, so that preceded the Tor Shulchan Aruch, which preceded the Shulchan Aruch. What preceded the Rambam when it came to Halacha? Uh, the Rith. Rabbeinu Al-Fasi. The, he's called the Rith. R-I-F. Which is really Resh Yud Pei. For Rabbeinu Al-Fasi. Where does the Rith appear? Does he have a separate book? Back of the, the back of the Gemara. You ever wonder about who's in the back of the Gemara? The Rif is one of the commentaries in the back of the Gemara. And what the Rif did is he took, he took the page of the Gemara and he pulled out from the page of the Gemara what he felt were the relevant halachic positions from the page of the Gemara. So now if I'm learning Gemara and I want to know what the halacha is, so I can flip to the back and I can see what the riff wrote down for halachos. But he did it in the order of the Gemara. Along came the Rambam and the Rambam said, I'm not doing it in order of the Gemara because if you want to look up a halacha, what do you have to know? You have to know where in the Gemara that halacha is discussed. I'm not doing it. That's too difficult for people. What am I going to do? I'm going to make it easier for people. I'm going to take all the halachos of davening and put them in one place, even though they might be scattered throughout the Gemara. I'm going to take all the halachos of Shabbos and put them in one place. I'm going to take all the halachos of whatever and put them in one place. That's what the Rambam did. So, so that, that's what the Rambam did, right? So you have the Gemara, the Rif, who was the earliest codifier, halachic codifier, the earliest halachic codifier, who took the halachos from the page of the Gemara, but maintained the order of the Gemara. The Rambam, the Rambam who took the, I'd same idea of the Rif, to take the halachos from the Gemara, but rather than keep them in the order of the Gemara, he put them together in his categories, his 14, 14 volumes, but he never gave any sources. And then you have the Rush, who decides that he is going to also do similar to what the Rambam did, but the Rush in his Tor Shulchan Aruch discusses all of the sources. He brings all of the Gemaras that led to his discussion as to why he believes that this is the Halacha. You have the commentary on the Rift, the Beis Yosef, who subsequently wrote his own called the Shulchan Aruch. Does that clarify the picture a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Question. So, so when I, when I did Daf Yomi, I always asked, "Who do you hold with?" So is it the Rift, the Rosh, Rambam? I, I mean, who? So when you say, "Who do you hold by?" The answer is, we, "We we hold with the Shulchan Aruch Why? as modified by the Rama." Why? Why was he accepted? Why was he accepted? So it's interesting. Did you ever ask? Did you ever wonder to yourself how Rav Moshe Feinstein became Rav Moshe Feinstein? Right. <laughs> Rav Moshe Feinstein wasn't always Rav Moshe Feinstein. I mean, he was always Rav Moshe Feinstein, <laughs> right? But he wasn't always Rav Moshe Feinstein, right? Rav Moshe Feinstein went to yeshiva also, right? Rav Moshe Feinstein probably also, uh, you know, played ball. Played ball, <laughs> right? 
I saw a video of Moshe Feinstein dancing with his wife at a chasana. Yeah. I, saw, I, have, I have that video, right? Right? <laughs> right? So, right? So, Rav Moshe Feinstein was, Rav Moshe Feinstein wasn't always Rav Moshe Feinstein. In fact, how did Rav Moshe Feinstein write about how he became Rav Moshe Feinstein? So, I don't know. <laughs> Said people just started asking me questions. Well, he had a vast, vast knowledge. Wow, so this is what happened. So people started asking him questions, and people realized that his answers were uh, Oiskahalten. How do you translate Oiskahalten? What they wanted to hear. Except Not what they wanted to hear. Well, right? Well thought, out. well thought, thank you. Well thought out, right? Well founded, well thought out. So more people started asking questions. And that's how Rav Moshe Feinstein became Rav Moshe Feinstein. So how did the Shulchan Aruch become the Shulchan Aruch? So first of all, remember, Rav, Yo Rav Yosef Karo isn't picking halachos out of thin air. He's got all these prior sources, right? You know, what do you, Bob, what do you call in halacha, right? In, in law, prior, prior decisions. What, precedent? Uh, stare decisis. Yeah, right. That exactly what I was thinking. Right, right. Exactly what I was thinking. Right, precedents, whatever it is. Right. So Rav Yosef Karo isn't making things up. He's taking it from. Remember the commentary that he wrote on on the Rush on the Torah Shulchanara, who took it from the Rif, who took it from the Gemara, right from the Rabbah from the Gemara. So, right. So you sort of see now. Now it's easy to understand how come Rav Yosef Karo represents the Sephardic position. Why? Because. Rav Yosef Karo commented on the Rush, who came from the Rambam, who came from the Rift. That's all Sephardic. It's all Sephardic, right? The, the bulk of our halachic system was codified within the Sephardic system. The bulk of our halachic system. You know, we, 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 think, we think everybody who wrote halacha, you know, uh, you know had payas and black hats and kapatas. Not true. <laughs> Most of the people who were involved in halachas had turbans, they wrote poetry, they studied science, they painted. A whole different story. Jerry. Two things. First of all, uh, we talk about the Rosh and the Rambam. This is not necessarily a question, it's a statement, correct me if I'm wrong. They don't even agree on what the 613 mitzvot are. Each one that's correct. Well, that, that's what makes it Jewish. <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct. There's, a lot of, there's lots of disagreements, right? Lots of, lots of disagreements, right? And, the, and, and, and again, I'm only referring to the codes of law. There's lots of other areas, right? The Rambam wrote his Sefer HaMitzvot, the Ramban wrote his Sefer, right? All, lots of different disagreements. I'm just trying to give a perspective on, on the law books, so to speak. Now, somebody asked the question, what's, what's the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch? What's the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch? It's an abridged version of the Shulchan Aruch. The Kitzer means abridged. It's an abridged version of the Shulchan Aruch. And it, it, it was, I don't know how popular it is today, but at one time it was very popular. Yeah. I have one adult. Right? Was it golden? Uh, well, uh, God is, God is <clears throat> I don't know. Somebody look up the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch. Gansfried. I think it was Gansfried. I think it was Gansfried who did it. Right? Why did he leave? It's probably easier to say what he included. Right? Right? It, it's, a, it's a small, it, I mean, it's... It's meant for the layperson to to get a you know a quick, you know to get a quick overview. Yes. It's very interesting. Um, in the shop, I think it was either Friday or on Shabbos, there actually was a discussion about the fact. Uh, I don't know who just brought it up about how there are several different opinions on each thing from all of the different sages of the time. There was a whole commentary about. It's not a question who, of who's right and who's wrong. It's exactly what you said. It's how, how thought out was the opinion? You know, and it was really a whole discussion exactly about, I, I don't know which who brought it up now, but that's exactly what was part of the Palestinian. So, that, so that's, we say we have a position, Elu ve'elu divre Elohim chayim. That what? That every, right? All of these opinions that are brought down, you read to the Gemara, you know, you read, you know, you'll, you'll have three or four different opinions, right? Does it mean that those three or four different opinions are one is right and the rest are wrong? No. They're all correct within their, within their understandings, within their perspectives. But when it comes to observing Shabbos, you can only, you can only have one opinion. 
right? I mean, you can only do it one way. You could have people who follow different opinions and people do follow different opinions. But you yourself, can, you, can't fo- you yourself can't follow two different opinions. You can only do it one way. So that's why we need halacha. That's, that's basically what we need halacha. Gans, gans free, right, yes. So the riff pulled everything out of the Gemara, right? Um, and so I assume it's just a removal of, you know, just, take, just putting it in some, in some sort of an order. Right, not not interpreting it. But. No, the riff added his interpretations as well. So what does he do? What does he do? Going back to where we started, what does he do with uh, uh, with this cooking business? No, okay. So so I I, I haven't so I haven't gone back and, that and far. Smarter, I haven't right? gone back that far. But if you want to, if you really want to learn, I don't know. Maybe maybe one day we'll do this. I'm not sure we'll ever finish Bishalakum, but <laughs> maybe one day we'll do this. Right? Uh, if you really wanted to learn halacha properly, what should you do? You should start with the Gemara, right? Go from the Gemara to the Rif, go from the Rif to the Rambam, go from the Rambam to the Tur, go from the Tur to the Shulchan Aruch, and then go to the more recent. That's the proper way to learn halacha. Because then, you know, uh, what, and that's what we try to do when we teach. In other words, I, I'm discussing with you today this halacha of, of Bishul Akum based on what the Gemara said. Now, um, Howie asked me, what did the Rif say about it? Thank God he didn't ask me. What did the, you know, what did the Rambam say about it? What did the Torah Shulchan Aruch say about it? But you could go back and you could find all of these sources. The Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo writes that, it, that since the Gemara specified that it was talking about baking bread, it only works for baking bread. Because, because bread, because bread is baked, bread, baking is a unique phenomenon, different than cooking. It only works for baking bread. And therefore, according to the Shulchan Aruch, according to the Rav Yosef Karo, according to the Minag of the Svardim, if you want to avoid a problem of Bishol Akum with a food, to which Bishalakum applies, the only way to do it is to be materially involved with the cooking process. Put it on the flame, stir it, something like that. The Ramah disagrees. The Ramah says, no. When, when the Gemara said baking bread, it was meant as an example. It was, it was a lenient opinion. It was meant as an example. And therefore the Ramah says it's enough to turn on the flame. It's enough to stoke the coals. Steve, go ahead. Baking bread is the number one food in those days that people hate. With bread. Okay. okay. Bread is the number one food when it comes to making breakfast for eating. You make it over bread, everything else is covered. Okay. Okay. So one would think that if his halacha is for bread, it should apply to everything. Which is talking. which is what the Ramah holds by. But the so Shulchan Aruch disagrees. The Shulchan Aruch disagrees. Yes, Raz. So according to Spartac tradition, if you throw in a uh, a chip of wood in a fire, you're taking care of only bread. Oh. Correct. Only bread. Correct. That only works by baking bread. bread. Otherwise, you have to participate in some physical way. So Correct. Do, Correct. Ashkenazim. What do they hold? Ashkenazim hold that it's always okay to throw in a chip of wood. For anything. For any, whether it's baking or no, cooking. I got, no, I got it. Okay, okay, now, what's the problem? The problem is that by and large, the kashrus agencies of America are Ashkenazi agencies. Ashkenazi kashrus agencies who follow the opinion of the Ramah. Follow the opinion of the Ramah. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? So now I'm a Sephardi and I want to eat in a restaurant. I want to go to grill time uh, or I want to go to Bistro Chosen, Bistro Burger, uh, the sub place, uh, wherever, right? 
Any place for Krizia. Any place for Krizia. Right? <laughs> what? Any place for Krizia. <laughs> I, I'm... Okay. I, all right. I want to go. I want to go out to eat. I'm a Sephardi. I want to go out to eat in an Ashkenazi restaurant. Can I rely on the Ashkenazi hashgacha? I can rely on it from a kashrus perspective, no question. Can I rely on it from a bishul akum perspective? I'm a Sephardi. I want to go to a hotel for Shabbos in Israel. I want to go to a hotel for Shabbos in Israel. Can I rely on the Arab chef in the hotel who's cooking? Right? There's an Ashkenazi guy who's supervising. He's turning on the phone. Can I rely on him? So this is a major, major issue. Right? And it's, the, it's really the interface of halacha. So, so now that you know that there are two different opinions, so it would seem that if you were a Sephardi, you should not be able to rely on Ashkenazi hashkacha in restaurants from the perspective of Bishul Akum. And indeed, there are many Sephardim who if they go into an Ashkenazi restaurant, they will ask to speak to the mashkiach, and they will ask the mashkiach for their order to please stir the pot or, or participate materially in, the, in their food preparation. Okay? That's what some will do. All right? Now, there is a famous heter of Ravavaji Yosef. Right, a famous heter of Rav, of Rav Ovadji Yosef, opposed by other Sephardic postkin, but Rav Ovadji Yosef was not a lightweight. Right, a famous heter of Rav Ovadji Yosef to allow an Ashkenazi to eat, to allow a Sephardi to eat in an Ashkenazi supervised <coughs> restaurant. Okay, what is it based on? What is this? What is this heter of Rav Avadji Yosef based on? Okay. So I need to introduce it a little bit. Okay. I need to introduce it as follows. If you go back to the beginning, we learned that the het, we learned that the prohibition of Bishal Akum was based on two factors. One factor being the kashras of the ingredients of the food itself. And one factor being the threat of intermarriage. That bishalakum would create that if I were allowed to eat food that were cooked by a non-Jew, that would increase my feelings of connection to this non-Jew. And by increasing my feelings of connection to this non-Jew, I'm opening the door for potential Inter, social interaction that might lead to mixed dancing that might lead to intermarriage. Maybe intermarriage before mixed dancing. I'm not sure. Right. But but right, but we'll head right, we'll head we'll head down that road. We'll head down that road. Okay? All right. So so we have the so here's the question. Does that apply to a non-Jewish housekeeper in my home, cooking in my home. Does that apply? <clears throat> forget, forget whether she's under my hashkach or not under my, so we're not, we're not. In other words, does the theory, does the theory that Bishul Akum, the prohibition of Bishul Akum is in place to avoid circumstances where I, where I would start to socialize with a family because they were able to invite me over for a meal and I'm grateful for the food that they prepare. Does that apply to the, my non-Jewish uh, housekeeper? Only if you're single. Only if you're single, I might have other issues. Only if you're Right? Unlikely. Leslie says unlikely. Well, the Ramah agreed with Leslie. And the Ramah said that if it's a non-Jewish housekeeper in the house who's under your employ, in other words, 
she's working for you. Yeah. Actually, what the Ramah was talking about is a time when she was your slave. Right? She was your servant, right? right? Forget, I, I don't know how much you paid her an hour. It's cer certainly nowhere near what you would pay a housekeeper today. But she was under your employee. She was your servant. Does it, does it according to the Ramah, it's not logical that I'm going to fraternize with my servant, her family, because she cooked dinner for me. That's ridiculous. And even more so. She's under my employ. Even more so for somebody who's in a kitchen in a restaurant. Uh, so that's, so the Ramah takes that lenient position. It's not clear, it's not entirely clear what the rationale of the Ramah is for that lenient position. He says, because she's your servant. Or he says, because in those days, what, what did they, in the days of the Ramah, when they cooked, what did they cook on? What did they cook on? Wood, fire. wood fires. They cooked on wood fires. How long do wood fires last? Not long, especially not with the technology in those days. Today, wood fires last a lot longer. You can have a wood fire that lasts all night. There are people, believe it or not, who actually heat their homes with wood. Right? So you can have a wood fire that lasts the, the whole night, but that's only because of technology today. Right? In those days, it didn't last. How long does a fire, you build a fireplace. How long, does it, how long does the fire last? A couple of hours. Right? And people had fires all the time because they needed to keep warm. So people were always doing what? They were always adding wood. They were always stoking the fires. So maybe the Ramaz leniency is because in those days, you know, people from the family, every time you walked by the fire, what did you do? You threw another, you threw another fire, another wood chip on the fire. You stoked the fire. So maybe that's what the Ramaz was. So it's not clear what the Ramaz leniency is. Anyway, today, by and large, under most circumstances, we don't rely on the Ramah's leniency. Because today, the housekeepers, the non-Jews that we have working in our houses, they're not our servants, they're not our slaves. They might be hired employees, or maybe they don't get paid on the books, I don't know, but, <laughs> right, right? But they're still hired, right? Right? It's not the same as a servant or a slave. I understand the servant or a slave. I'm not going to fraternize. And and maybe today, since we're using different fires, it's not the same. So most people reject the Ramaz leniency under most circumstances. Even Ashkenazim reject the Ramaz leniency under most circumstances. There might be a circumstance where a rabbi would rely on the Ramah's leniency. If it was an elderly person, there was no other choice in living alone. And you know, those are different circumstances. But by and large, under normal circumstances, we don't rely on the Ramah's leniency. But the Ramah does write this leniency. That's, what I, that, that's the background that I need to leave you with for right now. The Ramah does write this leniency. Steve. There's a concept you should pick your rabbi who you rely on, and you're consistently relying on him. Right or wrong. No, so, so if I rely on the Ramah for this and this and this, and all of a sudden I go, well, I'm not relying on one for this, I'm going to go to something else. Okay, so, so it's not as black and white as you suggest. In fact, pretty much no one follows a posek for all of the piske halacha. Steve is referring to the passage in Pirkei Avos that says, Asei lecha rav. Right? You know, you should have one rabbi that you go to for all of your questions. That's not really what Aselah Rav means. Aselah Rav means you should have one rabbi who teaches you and you should, you know, you should imbibe the knowledge, the wisdom of that rabbi. But in today's world, we learn from, uh, we learn from lots of different people. Lots of different rabbis, rabbitsons. We learn from lots. And Sparta. We learn from lots. Henry, go ahead. No, 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 that did not happen. Okay, so, okay, so, so we're going to put Steve's question aside for the time being. There are times where there are leniencies that most people say, you know what, the Ramah wrote this leniency down, but the Ramah's leniency was really written for a different time. The Ramah's leniency was really written for a different way in which people cooked, right? Things like that. Now, 
here's 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 I want to I want to get to this Rabbi Yosef Karo, all right? Um, and then Bob will take the question, okay? So there's there's certain things. So um, there's a principle in Jewish law called sveik sveika, right? Sveik sveika is a situation where I have two doubts. I don't want to get involved in all of the parameters of sveik sveika because there you could have a whole shear on just sveik sveika, right? What does sveik sveika mean? But sveik sveika is two doubts. Right? Meaning, I have a doubt whether the answer is A or B. And even if the answer is B, I have a doubt as to whether B should be interpreted this way or that way. That's an example of a sveik sveika. Okay? So, so the um, Ravavadja uses the concept of sveik sveika and applies it here. And Ravavadja says as follows, right? What is the Sveik Sveika? So Ravavadja says, one Suffolk is, maybe it's sufficient to throw the wood chip into the fire. In other words, the Rabbi Yosef Karo Paskins, it's not sufficient. But the Ramah says it is sufficient. So there is a doubt there. Now it's true, the Sephardim follow the opinion that it's not sufficient. But says Yosef, says, says Rav, Rav Avaji Yosef, there's a doubt, right? I mean, it, it's one doubt. Now that one doubt is resolved for Sephardim in a stringent way. But says Rav Yosef, Karo, maybe I can look at it and say there's a second doubt. Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe switches it around. I'm sorry, let's switch it around. The first doubt is maybe the Ramah is correct. In other words, maybe the, what, maybe the Ramah's position on non-Jews in our employ as opposed to non-Jews who we interact, who we could interact with socially. I'm not going to interact socially with non-Jews in my employ, but maybe Maybe the position of the Ramah is correct that non-Jews in my employ is sufficient to avoid the problem of Bishulakum. And even if that's not true, then maybe throwing the wood chip on the, co on the fire is sufficient. Now, so what is, what is Rabbi Yosef Karo saying? Rabbi Yosef Karo is saying, I have two doubts here. If I look at each doubt separately, yeah. those doubts are resolved, right? Rabbi Yosef Karo resolves the doubt as to uh, whether, whether Bishalakim applies to a non-Jew in our employ, and Rabbi, Yo and Rabbi Yosef Karo says it does. The Ramaz says no, but Rabbi Yosef Karo says it does. And when it comes to the question of whether or not a wood chip is sufficient, so Rabbi Yosef Karo says a wood chip is not sufficient, but says... Says Ravavaji Yosef that if I combine both of these doubts, in other words, maybe Rav Yosef Karo said that the wood chip is insufficient because he wasn't considering the question of the Ramah's leniency regarding a non Jew in employ. And maybe if the wood chip, maybe if it had been a non-Jew who was in our employ who was cooking, maybe Rav Yosef Karo would have said the wood chip is sufficient. In other words, you put these two doubts together, you put the sveik sveika together, and the sveik sveika yields, yields a leniency that either doubt resolved separately would not have yielded. So says Rav Avadja Yosef that because of this sveik sveika, a Sephardi could rely on the Ashkenazi halacha of Bishol Akum under, under these circumstances. Now, there are other Sephardic postkim who say, absolutely not. You don't go against Rabbi Yosef Karo. I don't care whether you're of Ashi Yosef or not, right? Rabbi Yosef, you got to follow what Rabbi Yosef Karo says. That's it. What the Mechaber says, that's it. No ands, ifs, or buts. But... Rabbi Yosef, but uh, Rabbi Vaji Yosef was not a lightweight. Then Rabbi Vaji Yosef published this famous heter that I think in reality many Sephardim rely on. I don't know. 
I will have to ask our Spartan. I think in reality, any Spartan. Where there is no fire, but only heat. Okay, so that's our that's next week, okay. right? And next okay. week is cooking without fire. That's the what about cooking the without fire? Top on or so then there. What? That's the Jew turn the cook top on. The very so least, right. the very least. No. I, no I, I'm going to answer your question by saying the Jew must do something. If you're an Ashkenazi, it's sufficient for the Jew to turn the cooktop on. If you're a Sephardi, it's not sufficient for the Jew to cook the, turn the cooktop on, and you have to stir the food. So the minimum is for Ashkenazi to turn the cooktop on? Correct. Minimum. Correct. That's the minimum. You can't do something different. And, and, and That's correct. That's correct. If it's called Chol or Shabbat? No difference. No difference. Bob, you had a question. Yeah, I, I just, this, this whole concept of, of the social interaction with non-Jews, and they have, sometimes it, it can create a danger of intermarriage and stuff. But, I mean, the premise seems to be if you're interacting with somebody, I mean, there are so many ways you, you could be their business partner, you could be in business with them, you could live next door. How do they demarcate what interaction is dangerous and what isn't dangerous? It's a great, it's a great question. And remember, the society in the days of the Gemara was much different than the society in which we live today. In the days of the Gemara, interactions between Jew and non-Jew were much more limited. We didn't live, we didn't live in the same neighborhood. We didn't, you, you know, the chances of you having a non-Jew as your next door neighbor in a Jewish, you know, back in the days of the Gemara, you know, were, were minimal, right? You, you might have a, Jew, a non-Jew as a business partner, that the Shulchan Aruch already talks about, right? You might have a non-Jew as a business partner. The Gemara talks about having a non-Jew as a business partner. But the prox, but socially interacting like that, in, other words, in those days, business was business and social was social. Today, business and social often overlap, yes. right? So it's a it's a very good question. It's a very good question. And and if today we were to legislate the laws, I have a feeling. In other words, that we would. I have a feeling that we would legislate them differently today then they were legislated back in the days of the Gemara, or 500 years ago back in the, you know, back in their 700 years ago back in the days of the Shulchan Aruch. I have a feeling that we would legislate them differently, but we're not bound to do that. So for instance, we say, we say you're not allowed to drink non-Jewish wine because to avoid socializing. Go to a bar and see how many people are socializing over wine as opposed to how many people are socializing over scotch Tequila, uh, beer, right? You know, all of those things. But we, we have what the Shulchan Aruch had, and we're not bound to add on to that which the Shulchan Aruch said. So it's a great question. It's a great question. But fortunately, we are able, we are allowed and able to stick with what we have without adding on more stringencies to it. There's, there's a case. <clears throat> Leslie was eating milk in and I'm eating meat, we can't eat at the same table. <clears throat> but if Leslie was a stranger, I can eat meat and eat, and that, that woman or whoever can eat meat. Correct. Because you're not going to socialize. You're not going to so, share food, you're so, not going to interact. That's right. that so Correct. why in that case, you're not worried about socializing, but you won't Because worry. in in the case of Bishalakum, you are eating mm -hmm. that person's food. That's what Bishalakum no, is all but about. But leaving the food aside, I'm talking about inter interaction between you and a stranger. Because the interaction between you and a stranger, there's stranger danger. So we were, you know, right, you, you avoid strangers. But now if the stranger's cooking for you, that's a whole different story. All right, everybody, have a great week.